Hi, thanks for joining us today. Today, I get the pleasure of interviewing Leah Robolito with the Food Allergy Education Awareness. And so I am excited to interview her. I'm going to put her on in just a moment. And we're going to be discussing the anaphylactic type allergies and how that really has a sociological and emotional um, effect on both the family and the child and the schools. And then um, that is different from food intolerances, which is what I practice and what I focus on. So let's join Leah now. Hi, Leah. Can you hear me? Okay, just a minute. Okay, so now we get to join with Leah Robolato. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, thanks for having me. Sure, I'm so excited to hear more of all the exciting things that you're doing and um, your awareness, but what's actually behind your mission and what, what makes you so passionate about what you do. Um, so the name of your organization, your small business is called officially? It's the Food Allergy Institute. I love that. I so, love that. So tell us a little bit about your mission and your passion about what, what it is behind what you do. So what we do is we really focus on, as the name says, food allergies. But unlike a lot of the other organizations that are looking towards the medical end of food allergies, which obviously is extremely important, we are looking at the psychosocial impact of food allergies. I, like many of your listeners and watchers, are, is a mom. I have um, two amazing kids, and one of them has a lot of anaphylactic allergies. And so about three and a half years ago, I left my corporate job and went back to school to become an expert in the psychosocial impact of living with long-term illnesses, specifically food allergies. While doing that, I was lucky enough to work with one of the leading nonprofits that works in patient advocacy and research. I left that organization in March to start the Food Allergy Institute, um, as well as I'm about to finish my master's in child adolescent psychology. Oh. And I'm using that knowledge to now help, and we focus on helping schools, private and public schools, to make schools more inclusive for schools, for children with food allergies. But what's great about our work is it translates to anyone who eats differently. So whether you eat differently for religious preferences, food allergies, and a number of other diseases, whether it's diabetes, epilepsy, there's kidney diseases. So we really work with schools to make their classrooms, their programs, after school programs, you know, sports programs, drama programs, not only safe, we do, we do touch on that because we do have the knowledge to keep classrooms safe, but also inclusive so that we reduce anxiety, we reduce bullying, we reduce stress. And we don't just focus on the child, but we focus on the whole family and the teachers because having children with food allergies in your classroom can be extremely stressful and extremely anxiety inducing for teachers. Yes. That's the nutshell. Of what we <laughs> no, <do>. that's amazing. <laughs> um, it is, you know, I, um, my business focus is a little bit different. We focus on food intolerances. And I can say from my experience that I'm always thankful that I live in the age that we live in now. It's a lot more supportive than I think in the years past, maybe like when we were growing up. So um, sometimes for me, people will think that I'm just gluten-free. Well, um, and so they'll bake things that are gluten-free. But for me personally, gluten-free items are not a healthy option. But they're really trying and they don't know and they get nervous around it or people don't understand. And then um, me as a person, when I have, we would have play dates, then we'd have people over and I would ask the parent, do they have any food allergies? But then it also depends on the age of the child and can they read a label and are they familiar with that product? And mm -hmm. does the parent need to bring snacks? And so that's just a play date. So I can't imagine what all goes into a classroom or even just a home on a daily basis. So. That's me relating to you and what you right. do. Right, yeah. and so food intolerance is different. So having a true food allergy is when it's life-threatening. 
Absolutely. And that is not at all to say that a food intolerance isn't important. Food intolerance can be life altering as you've experienced. Right. It can lead to migraines, really digestive issues. It can really take you out as I know you know. Um, but a food allergy reaction can lead to death and it can right. quickly lead to death if not treated with epinephrine right away. Right. Um, and so that's where really the quality of life is greatly impacted. Research has shown that mothers, specifically of food allergic children, have a very low quality of life. They're extremely lonely. They are often clinically depressed because of like what you said, when they go to have a play date. You know, I can remember when my own son was a toddler and you know, kids put everything in their mouth mm -hmm. and you have to really watch them. Um, and so people would want to have us over and I couldn't blame them. Um, you know, we weren't always brought to, you know, invited to the park or to things like that. And so it's very isolating. So part of this program that we are working with schools is to include the community. You know, and when I talk to other parents and to non-food allergic families, is I encourage them, whether that you see a food allergic mom or a mom with this, whatever the special need is, really please make the effort to invite them to coffee. You know, if you and your friends are going to be, you know, having a bunch of kids playing at the park, invite them. More than likely, they are going to have a plan on how to keep their kids safe, whether it's bringing their own snacks, making sure areas are wiped down. They're going to have a plan, you know, and ask them like you did, what do I need to do to make my home safe so your child can come play? What do I need to do to make sure that your child can come to my child's birthday party? It's incredibly freeing and it means the world to that family. That um, so imagine. Really, mm -hmm. So we really think, focus on family inclusiveness. I would think that that would probably bring tears to a mom's eyes if they were asked those questions and they had felt isolated. Yeah, I mean, I talked to a woman about a month ago who her child was in third grade and they had never been invited to the neighborhood get together ever. And they lived in that neighborhood for three years. So she found, and I said to her, well, why don't you just host it? Go find out who's sort of the main person and say, look, we know we have a complicated food history for back of a letter word. You know, the neighborhood had seen ambulances come to their house on a yearly, if not more basis. Just to look, we, and just say, I really want to be involved in this. We can do it. Please invite us. And she did. And, they, and now they were invited. And you know, the, it's really because people are afraid of killing your child because when you see in the media, you know, you see two different things, you know, either people making fun of food allergies or people saying, Oh my God, such and such is going to die. And there's so much in between. Right. And so it's really becoming more inclusive of everyone. And right. so just really leading with kindness is always a great place to start. Well, that's amazing. I mean, that's coaching. You're coaching families. I, I know as a family, we're always evolving and learning ourselves, but, you know, using your experiences to help guide others, you know, is what makes you successful and encouraging people. And um, so we kind of touched on briefly on how um, parents deal with that. How do, how do allergies affect children emotionally? Like what have you seen in maybe your house or just some people that you've known, how it affects actual children? So along with my own experience, I've done quite a bit of research and research has shown that children really have a higher level of anxiety. They have increased checking behaviors. So if you have a child with one, two, three, even five multiple food allergies, they're going to go to school and they're going to do checking and checking includes things like repeatedly washing their hands, which a food allergic child needs to do, but they're going to check more than they need to, making sure that the areas are clean. They're going to make sure their friends are cleaning their hands. They're going to make sure that, you know, doorknobs are being wiped, things that they should do to a point, but they're going to do it a little bit more than they need to do. And so that when you see a child checking more than they need to do, so that's a sign of anxiety. They have higher levels of anxiety. They have lower social interaction, again, because of anxiety. They tend to be not included in events, so they tend to have some depression, um, just lower um, quality of life scores. And these, again, can be fixed with the adults sort of working in. And it starts from a young age. 
And we have been really fortunate. And you know, as my husband always says, because you're pushy, I would like to say that's because I'm an advocate. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, that I've been, and I've had the resources. You know, one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is food allergies are expensive. Having special food, having epinephrine auto injectors, going to multiple doctor's appointments, and having a job that I've been able to do. And, you know, I honestly quit my corporate job because it was too hard. It was literally too hard to be a corporate executive and a mom of a special needs child. Right. I was very fortunate that I have a husband that has a good job with great benefits and that I could do that and dedicate my life to this new world of being a special needs mom. Right. Um, and not everyone can do that. So, you know, we do understand that we're fortunate and blessed in that way. Um, but children tend to you know, put themselves in a bubble more than they need to do. And so they need adults starting at a young age to advocate and let them know that they can do it and that they don't need to be in this bubble. They do need to have what I like to call a healthy level of anxiety. They do have to read labels. They do have to wash hands. They do need to make sure their friends are washing their hands. Um, but with the support of the adults around them and then the support of some really great friends, they really can do anything really anything. There's no limit. Well, I think seeing a child go from um, retracting and um, not, and as you grow as a child and you develop, you learn social cues and you learn how to make friends and you're missing part of that development when they have anxiety. So mm -hmm. they're missing that part and they need to be taught and they need to be encouraged and supported. And it's hard if the parents also having to deal with um, you know, the inclusion and then plus the newness of knowing that they have an allergy, what it is and what to do. It can definitely get overwhelming. And you don't want to miss that window of opportunity teaching young kids how to get along socially, especially right. in this day and age where they can kind of, you know, exclude themselves and be on electronics all day. And there's yeah. other ways to entertain themselves. And you're having to teach the child, no, you need to do this and um, keep up with normal development. Yeah. And it's a challenging balance. And, you know, one thing I like to point out to families is don't forget the siblings. As I said, I have two children. And so I have one child with 13 anaphylactic allergies and nine of those are food. Um, and my other son, no allergies. It's totally fine. Wow. And I get a lot of interesting comments about why that might be. And the truth is we don't know. Um, but I will say my younger son is his oldest brother's biggest champion, but he's also seen a lot. He's seen his brother be taken away in an ambulance. He's seen, you know, kind of a lot of scary things for a little guy. He's only seven now. Um, and so that will, that does affect him and that will affect other siblings. Um, in fact, on my website, there's a blog that, uh, is entitled, don't forget about me. Yeah. And so I encourage parents that, of course, you do have to, if your child's having a reaction, you have to focus on that child. Right. But after and even before, prepare them for when a reaction might look like. It is scary. Right. What is an ambulance doing? So there was a good year where my son, my younger son, was afraid of ambulances. He was afraid of fire trucks because he associated them with his brother being sick. So we had to sort of retrain him. And, you know, it's okay to be a little afraid. But we also had to show them that, you know, the epinephrine auto injector saved his brother and made him feel better. And that, you know, we would support him and support his brother. And so that this is just part of how we live. And everyone has something that's a little different. In every household you drive by, you really don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Right. Um, so, you know, don't forget about that sibling. They, are, they might have their own anxiety, their own social differences. So just remember that you're a, a whole family living with food allergies. It's not just one child or two childs or two children living with food allergies. It's the whole family. Right. Absolutely. I like the comment, especially talking about, you know, behind closed doors, right? We all have things that we're struck. No one has perfect health. No, no one. No one. <laughs> um, and as we get older, you're like, wait, this isn't working like it used to. Yeah. Uh, Everything's falling apart. And you're just constant. It's a constant and um, you re it's a lifestyle regardless of any health need. It's a lifestyle that you have to constantly maintain. It's never going to be out of your inbox. No, it's always going to be there. Um, then I wanted to talk a little bit. We mentioned a little bit about a parent 
um, but what impact does it have on parents and caregivers? And so I thought maybe we could talk about maybe from um, a, a school, from um, a teacher's eyes in the classroom, because I can't imagine, you know, they have anywhere from, you know, 10, 15, 20, 28 kids in a classroom. And um, depending on the age of the child, they might have an awareness or, you know, what if a child is a little bit more tired that day, isn't thinking, they're distracted, and they come in contact with something. So, I mean, there's a lot of variables that play into that. But what would you say are some of the key um, points that you'd want to make on why it's so difficult for caregivers and teachers in schools? So, for teachers, and um, let me first of all and say I love our teachers. They do the job of therapists, you know, surrogate parents educators, and so they have a lot on their plate. And so to add on this element of a special need, and they deal with a range of special needs in their classrooms. And so when we add on a food allergy, and then you constantly have what a lot of teachers really stress over is birthday cupcakes, celebration pizza parties, celebration candy, you know, there's just, there's a lot of food that gets brought in our classrooms. And you know, you have to eat. You're at school between six and eight hours a day and you have anywhere, like you said, from 10 to almost 30 kids, depending on the school district and the grade. And the teacher has to be aware of what a food allergy reaction looks like and knowing that it can change from instance to instance. And even as you just said, if the child is tired or maybe recovering from a cold or flu, they're more likely to have a reaction to a smaller amount. So this puts a lot of stress on the teacher. So one of my tips for schools is, is for things that you can avoid food. We're not saying get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you certainly need it, especially for little kids. You know, my um, second grader is starving about every three hours. Um, you know, and so is my fourth grader. They need snack time. Heck, I'm hungry like every two hours. <laughs> um, but, you know, have a system for it. You know, every kid is usually old enough to, you know, have their snack and wipe their own desk with, you know, one of those wipes. Um, have a system for, you know, washing hands before everyone gets in the classroom. Stop by the bathroom, wash your hands, have them move a clip, give them a star for doing that. Um, get kids in the habit of washing their hands. There's many reasons why we want kids washing their hands. Um, you know, let's just face it, kids are gross. <laughs> um, right, we're, we're about to head in full force to cold and flu season, so this is beneficial on multiple levels. On many levels, you know, before kids go to lunch, have them wash their hands. After lunch, have them wash their hands. Play, you know, just kind of make hand washing throughout the day, wash their hands. And then when you do have things to celebrate, ask the classroom. You know, for younger kids, for birthday celebrations, say, let's celebrate everyone's October birthday. Here are some things we can do. We can have a dance party. The birthday person can pick something out of the treasure box. We can have extra recess time. You know, and you know, if you contact me, I can help your school with a list of things per grade. For older kids, we talk about things like automatic A on this weekly spelling test or whatever weekly test you have. Again, more recess time or a homework pass. Nine out of 10 kids pick the non-food. <laughs> yeah, they skip. They don't want, they care less about the cupcake. Right. And then we do identify some kids who still want that cupcake. And oftentimes, not always, oftentimes it's because those kids don't get that special treat at home because there's a financial issue around it. And when that need, that, that then identifies for the school counselor, the principal, whoever's in charge of that, a need. So maybe what they can do is say, gee, let's make sure we get a birthday cake delivered to that family. Right. And then that way that family can have that special treat birthday cake and it's, you know, it's done without anyone in the school knowing. But then we realize that, gee, this, poor, this kid, not poor kid, this kid is showing us they have a need for this. They maybe have not gotten a birthday cake in the last two years because mom or dad has been laid off or money is really tight. And this is just something that can't be done. And then we can address that need separately. Right. Or, you know, if they have that, that need, you know, as far as an allergy and that child, birthday child suggests, um, I'd rather have a homework pass. I know our three boys would ask for a homework pass. Oh yeah. Um, and mom would be like, yay. Um, to have a cupcake sent home, you know, or, you know, that's a really good idea to have that option because I think a lot of parents, you know, 
we're, we're trying to get our children to eat healthier and making better choices. And there's multiple birthdays in the classroom sometimes per week or per month. And they've had, you know, two Six or three cupcakes. cupcakes already. And, you know, then you have sports and then you have family celebrations. And really, we do not need that many treats in our everyday life. So right. I think thinking outside of the, the dessert box is a really good idea for everybody. Right. And like you said, between the intolerances, there's religious preferences, there's just maybe mom, dad don't want our kids eating a ton of like processed sugar every day. I mean, right. I can tell when my younger son's had like a cupcake at school that I didn't say okay to because he comes home all, I was like, did you have sugar today? like oh their lips are blue no yeah Yeah. you know I'd rather I mean trust me I'd rather the homework pass too because I know I'm thinking thinking, do we have vodka because I don't know if I'm going to make it through spelling this week like you know right give everyone a break um it's a lot to keep up with um right we've talked about how you work with schools and how and where are you located or how do you work with schools so I'm located in Atlanta, Georgia, but we work with schools nationwide. Um, I can do it like we're doing now with Zoom, or I can fly to you. Um, Very close to Atlanta airport, we go everywhere. Um, So it's really however the client feels comfortable. So I do fly to some of my clients for an initial sort of consultation. We talk, we walk through. What's great about our programs, we have sort of a ladder model where you really have to train the administration, the teachers, and get everyone on board for sort of the program. And then you move down to the students or move up, depending on how you want your ladder to go. Mm -hmm. And then what we love to bring on is the community. Because if you get community in, and we really talk about inclusion, we love when schools bring in the inclusion part with their community. And this takes place, this can, you know, we're not talking about doing programs you know, you need me to come to your school year after year after year and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are small things that make a difference in your school community. And we talk about inclusion. We talk about leading with kindness. We talk about reducing bullying. Children with food allergies are more like, are one or 30% more likely to be bullied. And that's of the children that we know about. We also know that 50% of cases of bullying go unreported. Right. And the challenging part of a student with a food allergy, the bullying usually involves their allergen. So let's say you're allergic to milk. So another student might put a little bit of milk in your food without you looking. And that would cause anaphylaxis. And if it's not recognized right away, it does. You know, I like to say that we don't need to, you know, go straight to death. The truth of the matter is, If an allergic reaction, an anaphylactic reaction is not treated properly and quickly, it can lead to death. And we like to make sure that everyone in our schools is properly trained to recognize and respond to anaphylaxis. And then also that our teachers and our administration are trained to look out for what food allergy bullying looks like, because it's a little bit different. So we like to have that. And then we like to train our communities. And what I talk about in training our communities is to really train them to think about different ways. So this includes parent teacher organizations, parents who are room parents, who volunteer at sports and dance and you know all the other extracurricular activities of how they can really be involved in making our communities supportive and leading with kindness. No, you made some excellent thought-provoking points for sure about right. the, bullying, the bullying. And of course, you know, we know that that's even more prominent now with social media and other things. But then you yeah. also still have those prankster kids that really, maybe if it's lack of self-control or, you know, family dynamics or whatever, they don't have as heightened self-control as other kids. And so maybe they are, maybe they are, um, not thinking about the food allergy, they just want to be, play a prank, maybe not knowing that they have a food allergy. So I've never thought of that being the case that someone could tamper with someone's food, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Well, right. and so they'll, you know, there's times where kids might say, let's throw, you know, cheese and see what happens, or let's smear some peanut butter. And this is, this happens more um, in middle school, believe it or not. Right. Kids will be involved in their own. So, Bullying is not the right word, but they'll be involved and be like, yeah, let's put peanut butter on me. 
I haven't had a reaction in a few years. Let's see what happens. Let's, like, let's test it out. So, you know, again, raising the awareness and, you know, helping parents talk to their own kids. And then once kids get in high school, they tend to not want to carry their epinephrine auto injectors. So really, if you have an inclusive community that makes it okay to be carrying your epinephrine auto injector, you know, make sure that people, you know, your friends say, hey, we're going out. Why don't you have your auto injector? Um, you know, so make it, it's completely inclusive. You know, just like a kid with diabetes might have their pump attached. Right. We want the same acceptance for this disease as any other disease. It's equally as serious, but it's very livable. Right. Right. And and, and also the psychology aspect of and giving those children those skills of knowing how to pick friends. Right. Have supportive friends in our home. We call them got your back friends where um, if we can identify three to five friends that will have your back and understand you. Um, so that is a really good point of um, identifying people that will be supportive and care yeah. and understand. You know, I've had to <laughs> have a similar conversation with my own son. You know, he's nine, fourth grade. It's, you know, being a kid is hard. And, yeah. You know, he wants to be friends with everyone. I said, well, you know what? Sometimes... Our, you know, I had to have a kind of tough conversation with him last year and there was a kid that I just didn't think was going to be a great friend. Right. And I, said, I know he's cool, but he's not making the best decisions. And do we want to be friends with someone who's going to pressure you to make bad decisions? I said, well, I don't know. You know, so it was kind of this long, it took like a two week, you know, sometimes you wish they would just listen, but you know, you have to really, and again, to help the community talk to their kids and give them tools. So that's why I really love when schools take that community piece. Right. Because then we can help parents learn the language to talk to their kids about how to be inclusive because it's not, you know, those baby books do not prepare you for middle school and for high school and really like school. And, and it's how not to the help. same. No, there needs to be a what to expect every year. And there's just not a new edition, but I think, you know, what we know is middle school and high school is completely different than mm -hmm. what there is now. We just had a meet the teacher last night and it just was an incredible school and it, I enjoyed meeting all the teachers, but it's just mind blowing, literally understanding how they're learning on a different level and it's different style parenting. And we're learning as we go, of course, but it makes it a lot more tricky. Um, okay, so I wanted to know if you had any testimonials or stories, you know, either from your home um, of how easy an incident can happen or um, just a testimonial from a client that you've had of how easy an incident could happen. Because I don't think people realize, even if you're so, aware, and then obviously, you know, you need to know how to respond and that's where training would come in. But I didn't know if you had any stories you'd like to share with us. I do. Actually, you know, I always think that it's great for people to see that I'm not perfect. And like I said, my son has quite a few allergies. He was playing it. In fact, this will be up on my web someday, but my son was playing next door and we, my, our good friends live next door. They have kids the same age. They go back and forth and play. Um, and they accidentally had a latex balloon, which is one of my son's allergies in their house. And the young girl who's the same age as my son, they play together all the time, saw it and just pushed it under her bed, thinking that would keep him safe. Um, and of course it didn't, he went into anaphylaxis and they quickly, you know, he said to the mom that I feel weird. I knew he was having hives, he was having trouble breathing coughing, wheezing, and keep in mind, I'm a hundred yards away. Like, you know, there's not like we're across the driveway. And so she looked at, I have, I gave her one of our posters to recognize and respond. We've trained her, you know, we've done all this stuff. We've right, you know, been friends for almost two years now. Um, and so she realized what was happening quickly gave her, gave him his auto injector, called 911 while sending one of the other kids next door to come get me. And it was, you know, what was great. And what my post is going to talk about is that was a success. We'd really try to focus on the success because I, I see a lot of people getting really upset. Yes, it was upsetting that he had a reaction. He was upset he had a reaction. He was frustrated. He yelled at me that it's my fault. He has allergies. It's not, it's no one's fault. But that was successful. 
he told an adult that he didn't feel well. That adult realized what was happening and gave him his auto injector right away and called 911. He was taken to the hospital, given more medication, observed, and he was back in school a day later. He is totally fine. That's success in my book. And there's a lot of those cases. So what we really want to look at is how do you react when something happens? Do you stay calm? Do you provide, what's really important with allergic reactions, anaphylactic re allergic reactions, is that epinephrine is given quickly and 911 is called. Right. So the, the times when you see people die from anaphylaxis is generally, not always, but generally, is because there was a delay in epinephrine. So there's a term that's very popular in the allergy community is epi first, epi fast. If you ever feel like you need to give epinephrine, give it. Right. There is no documented case of someone dying from having epinephrine. Um, you know, in my own house, again, <laughs> I, had a, a, I had just had my second son. I was very tired. He was maybe, my second son was maybe six months old. I had gone to New York for a family wedding where my then my I was up for 36 hours because everyone was crying. We came home at the time we lived in Houston and I accidentally gave my then two and a half year old dairy milk instead of his coconut milk and off to the right, you know, realized it right away. He went to anaphylaxis. I gave him this epinephrine, called 911, went to the hospital. All of this happened so quickly that my husband was upstairs with the baby in the nursery with the sound machine on. Didn't even know we went, what happened. Right. So you go again, into action. You go into battle. Yeah. yeah. I just did it. So again, it happens. Accidents, mistakes, especially if you have a lot of allergies are going to happen. Right. What I like to see, and in fact, um, there's a great organization called Red Sneakers for Oakley. Um, if you follow them on Instagram and Facebook, and they have a great website, and they work really hard to raise awareness and raise money for research to find a cure for food allergies. They often list stories of people who have learned, you know, to give epinephrine right away because of their organization. Um, and I always like to point out, what did you do right? You know, people talk about, oh, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And I'm like, people are more scared. Right. right. What did you do right? Don't be afraid of that epinephrine needle. It's really tiny and you feel so much better after. So I really want people to realize that when they're making those allergy plans, when they're advocating for their kids, no matter what, whether they have a food intolerance, a food allergy, um, ADHD, autism, diabetes, whatever your issue is, when you're advocating, even if your husband calls you pushy, you're doing a great job. So I want you, you know, when I talk to my clients, whether it's a school or a teacher or one of my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients, I really want everyone to take a moment at the end of the day and say, what did I do well today? And pat yourself on the back because we spend so much time as a society being negative. Right. But think about it. something you did today was good. Right. You may have had a crap this day. Is awesome. a this is an awesome interview. <laughs> but you did something. You put your shoes on right. <laughs> you know, you brushed your teeth. Something you did went well today. And so every day, I, you know, every night I write in my journal and it's literally one or two sentences, mm -hmm. but I write something I, that went well today. One or two sentences. So I would love for everyone watching to start doing that. And I really think if we, as a society, lead with kindness and think about all the things that went well, right. it would just make a huge difference. You know, I was thinking about your business and all that you offer to people that, you know, hearing it from just like in your own home, when you hear things over and over again from your parents, it just doesn't absorb the same as you're hearing it from a teacher. Now, if you're a student in the classroom and there is allergy awareness and education going on, hearing it from a teacher in a school, being supported by someone like you makes it even more impactful. So I really do feel like, you know, your business has a lot to offer for schools. I mean, it's always changing new information and clinical research is always coming out. And I know that you follow all of that and keep up to date and um, look at it from multiple level, multi levels, you know, how it impacts, you know, everybody. So I think that you have a lot to offer. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned um, how you stay positive and encouraged through journaling. Um, any other, like maybe a few tips that you have, um, for parents, I know that you mentioned that 
Um, you never know what goes on behind closed doors and that everybody has health struggles and that you're not, you're even all that you know that you're not perfect and things happen in your house. Um, what three things do you, um, three tips would you kind of give as takeaways or tips that you give yourself often? So for food allergy parents, I would say, you know, slow down. You know, mistakes happen when we rush through things. Slow down, you know, whatever you're, wherever you're going to, whether it's a dinner party, school, I know it's really hard, but slow down. When you're going to talk to your school about food allergy awareness, or maybe it's going, you know, a lot of people, either most people I know because I live in the South, um, but a lot of, you know, I'm from the Northeast, so a lot of people are either just going back to school or going back in the next week or two. Um, when you go to talk to your school about your child's food allergy, go with a positive attitude. A lot of people will go to school saying, my child has and you have to do this and you have to do that. You're not going to get anywhere. That's and threatening. <laughs> don't start threatening. Ask them to partner with you. When you say my child has peanut, egg, and a wheat allergy, and I want to see how we can work together to make his classroom or her classroom safe and inclusive, and here are some ideas I have. Or even better, I would love for you to call the Food Allergy Institute and my, either myself or one of my um, staff can follow up with them. Um, that would Absolutely. be great too. <laughs> um, but, um, and I will put your contact information in yes. the link in the comments below because people need to know how to reach you and we'll have comments on how people can follow you and um, your website linking and get in contact with you. And if you have e questions for either um, Leah or myself, um, I want to make sure that we have that information for you available. But um, so we don't want to give all your tips away. My third tip really quick <laughs> is to let your kids be empowered. Yes. From a very young age, you know, obviously go behind them, but let them start ordering and asking questions. Let them in on those 504 meetings. Let them be a part of it. So that when, you know, I had a client call me, their child was headed to college and had never done their own label reading. So you want to start sooner than that. Right, right. Empower them and train them well. So when, as they get older in middle school and high school, they have those. Mm -hmm. That probably happens more than we know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So thank you so much for today. I know I could probably, you know, Talk we could talk for hours. Her. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, have, if there's any comments, we can have another topic or if they have any questions as well. So I look That's forward great. to getting this up for everyone and then having the links um, below. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I look forward to talking again soon. Great. Me too. Thank you so much.